going to be talking about spectrum analysis and, um, and background modeling. Quick outline, uh, just a brief overview of X-ray generation and where the background actually comes from. There are some different um, philosophical approaches to the background signal in EDS. Some people consider it nuisance and should just be removed, filtered out, subtracted. I tend to disagree with that and um, we do show the background completely in our software. We don't modify it. Going through this, I'd like to explain why we do that and why it's a very good idea to keep the background in there. But we'll be talking about the uh, charging and the Dwayne Hunt limit a little bit as well. A bit of geometry and how it affects the background in the EDS spectrum. Um, background modeling, the Bramstrahlung model or the SNP model that we also use, SNP filter really. And then a brief summary of it and I'll show some of the stuff on the microscope as well. But the essence of it is that uh, if we look at a spectrum, we have a background in there and we have some characteristic peaks. Most of the time we only care about the characteristic peaks, what elements do we have that's in the sample. But the background holds a lot of information as well. The background itself is being generated by um, electrons being slowed down um, or accelerated as they move through the sample and they'll emit radiation as that happens, whereas the characteristic peaks are generated by the transitions between the electronic states within the atoms in the sample. So in and by itself, the background doesn't really contain much information about the sample. But any charged particle that undergoes acceleration, deceleration, change in velocity, will emit radiation. This is what we use in synchrotron facilities and things like that as well. Why it happens inside the sample, um, if you have a core with the shells around it, and think about one of the electrons we're shooting in from the electron gun. We have a positively charged core and we have a negatively charged electron, so we have Coulomb interaction between them and the negatively charged electrons, the closer it is to the core, the more forces exerted on it, the more change in direction. So as we move further out, we get less change and less change. This can be, the emitted um, radiation from this can be described by Kramer's law. And it's basically just uh, the number of photons, uh, depends on the average atomic number of the sample, the larger the core we have, the more positive charge, the more we bend the incoming electrons, Kramer's constant, and uh, the incident beam energy. So it changes with the actuation voltage of the microscope as well. If we plot that out, we have the curve down on the bottom left from Kramer's law, and compare that to what we see in EDS spectrum. They don't really look anything alike. You can see in the EDS spectrum, it drops off down towards the low energy range, whereas Kramer's law says it should go up. We should basically continue towards infinity. The difference here is Kramer's law is what's emitted. What we have in the spectrum is what's detected. So the emitted x-rays have to make it out of the sample. They have to make it through the detector and everything else before we can actually count them. So our modeling is not based on Kramer's law directly. We use a modified uh, model. We have the reference down at the bottom. Um, Frank Eggert is our main theory guy. He's also here, so you may meet him or even see this presentation. But the model we use, um, the point is that we incorporate the sample self-absorption. Most of the x-rays, the low energy stuff that's generated in the sample, will never make it out of the sample because it's reabsorbed. And we scale it by the detector uh, efficiency as well. So if we do that, we see the red curve that I've overlaid on Kramer's Law, and which is much closer to what you actually see inside the sample. Now, the model we're applying tells us that the background shape will depend on the incident beam energy. When you change your acceleration voltage, you change your background. It changes depending on the sample composition. The sample self-absorption plays a role in the background itself. And that's where we get information about the sample. Um, this absorption also changes a little bit with geometry, which we'll also show in a few slides. And then we have a couple of fit parameters. And of course, it also depends on the detector itself. One of the big things to note here is 
both Kramer's law and our model tells us that we can't have any X-rays emitted with higher energy than the incoming electron from the uh, primary beam, also known as the Dwayne Hunt limit. So, essentially, we should see the background cut off at the landing energy, which should, in most cases, uh, be equivalent to the excretion voltage that we're putting down through the microscope. That should be a sharp cutoff, or a cutoff at least. That's not always the case, um, or it is always the case, but actuation voltage and the cutoff don't always coincide. If we have charging samples, what will happen is um, we put down electrons and non-conductive samples. Um, normally, we would have all the electrons scattering around, moving around through the sample, draining them out through the stage. We can measure our specimen current and all that. A non-conductive sample or a charging sample basically means the electrons can't move around. They can't flow freely through the sample. So instead of all of them draining out from the stage, we have a buildup of electrons on the sample. If we have a charged particle sitting around, we will have an electrical field. Here we have a negatively charged particle, which means we generate a negative field, and we're trying to push a negatively charged particle and the electron down through that field. So you'll have, again, Coulomb interaction, um, essentially meaning you slow down the incoming electron. The landing voltage of that electron is not the actuation voltage that we put down through the gun. One of the ways to get around this, we'll take a look at that too, is uh, variable pressure mode. If we put the microscope into variable pressure mode where we basically run a dirty vacuum, bleed a bit of gas in there. We'll have gas molecules um, floating around. Some of those will hit the sample surface and carry away the charge. So variable pressure is one of the methods we can use to get around charging. But the point is that the spectrum in the background will tell us when we have charging and when we do not have it. So this is a spectrum from a silicon dioxide sample. I'm running it in high vacuum and then increasing pressures throughout. And if we just look at the, um, I've normalized everything to the oxygen peak here. If we look at the silicon peak, you can see as I increase my pressure, I get more and more silicon signal. This is the same sample, it's a silicon dioxide. There's no change in the composition here, but I get a change in the intensity of the X-rays. And this is because I changed my ionization cross-section because my landing voltage changes. How much it changes, if we look at the background tail, so I have 15 kilovolts of acceleration voltage here. You see my plot goes from zero to 15. And as I go to higher pressures, this background tail stretches all the way out to 15. So at 30 uh, pascals, I no longer have any charge but you can see as my pressure decreases, going all the way down to high vacuum, that tail moves further and further in. I get more and more charge buildup on the sample, meaning my Dwayne Hunt limit moves in. And essentially at the uh, high vacuum, I'm not putting my electrons down with 15 kilovolts. I have about three, four kilovolts of landing energy. So that translates into the um, the overvoltage, what we always talk about, that should have a certain amount of energy above the absorption line you're trying to look at to ensure good excitation. That's the difference we see on the left-hand side. As we decrease the pressure, we get more and more charging, we get less and less overvoltage, and we get le less efficient ionization of the silicon. We get less silicon signal, even though the composition is the same. Using our background model, we can assess what the actual Dwayne Hunt limit is and consequently what is the landing voltage, the true landing voltage on the sample. So we have here, um, we're supposed to have 15 kilovolts coming down. That's my actuation voltage. But if I click the quant button on this high voltage spectrum, telling the software that we have 15 kilovolts of landing voltage, it's going to be garbage. It will tell me I have 91 atomic percent oxygen and 9 percent atomic silicon. Because if we look at this spectrum, you can see the oxygen peak is significantly higher than the silicon peak. 
if I tell our model, the quant model, that no, I don't have 15 kilovolts, I have 3.35 kilovolts, as we can see from the spectrum, it's a Duane Hunt limit, all of a sudden, I get reasonable quant numbers. Silicon dioxide, 6633. Um, so 3.35 is around where my actual landing voltage is, and not the 15 we thought we had, based on the actuation voltage. And this, you can easily see just by looking at the tail of the, uh, of the background. So normally we plot it so you don't see the tail. Um, you don't always have charging. But if you have samples that you think may be charging, it's always a good idea to look at this tail off the background, see where does it trend off to see if you have charging on your sample. So that piece of information is hidden in the background tail and it's already there. Um, so make use of it. The geometry of the system itself um, also has an effect on the background. So just the basics of the geometry inside the system. We have what we call the elevation angle. The detector is on the back side for you, so you can't quite see it, but the, uh, the detector typically comes in at an angle of 35 degrees into the chamber. And the elevation angle is the angle between horizontal and the detector normal. So 35 degrees in most cases. We have what we call an intersection distance, which is the distance where the um, normal to the detector coincides with the electron beam. This is basically the sweet spot of the microscope, where we have the most efficient um, X-ray collection. And then we have the working distance of the microscope, which is the distance from pole piece to sample surface. If we're at ideal conditions, then the intersection distance and the working distance is the same. On this microscope, the, uh, the designed um, intersection distance is 15 millimeters. So on this microscope, we would want to be around 15 to have the optimum collection. On other microscopes, the size over there, it's 8.5. If you're on a FIB, it may be five or even four millimeters. So you change the system to system. Um, but in general, your working distance should be identical to the intersection distance to be at the sweet spot. It doesn't have to be, um, which is what we'll show in a minute. But all of these intersection distance and elevation angles are fixed parameters. That's fixed as soon as the uh, detector is bolted onto the microscope. The working distance, that's this button you have on the microscope or knob or whatever you have. That one can be changed freely to focus on different parts of uh, or different depths in the sample. Ideally, it should be close to the working distance. The takeoff angle is then the angle between X-ray trajectory and sample surface. So. The takeoff angle will depend on the detector angle, the elevation angle, where it's positioned, the working distance, and the tilt. If we have our sample located at the intersection distance, then the takeoff angle will be equal to the elevation angle, in this case 35 degrees. If I tilt my sample, you can see the green angle there. If I tilt it, now my takeoff angle is larger than my elevation angle. If I start to move the sample down, again, my takeoff angle will increase as I move it further down is the angle towards the detector. So tilting the sample or moving the sample down, both of those increase the elevation angle. These are spectra acquired uh, at different tilts. It's a indium tin oxide ITO sample, and I have zero going up to 50 degrees tilt. Composition is the same for the entire thing, the same grain. I just tilted it and refocused on the grain. And we can see here, if we look at the tail of the background where we saw the charging before, there's no difference here. That's all identical. And we can see it tails off nicely towards 15 kilovolts. So this is a conductive sample as ITO should be. But if we look in the low energy range, you can see as I tilt the sample towards the detector, the background starts to go up in the low energy range. S subtle, but it is there. So what's happening here is um, essentially if we think about a sample and the red line is supposed to be an x-ray, we generate a certain depth into the sample. If I start tilting my sample, 
I change the amount of sample that X-ray has to move through as it goes towards the detector. Which means at the tilted sample, looking at the same depth into the sample, there's less absorption of the X-rays. It has to move through less material, meaning less sample self-absorption. Low energy X-rays are easier to absorb than the high energy X-rays. So this effect will primarily be in the low energy range and it's basically an increase of the low energy signal. And that's what we're seeing here on the left hand side. As I tilt my sample, I get slightly more yield of the low energy X-rays, which of course affects the characteristic piece as we can see, but also elevates the background just a little bit in the entire low energy range. The same thing happens when I start moving the sample down as I have on the left hand side. As I move the sample down, my takeoff angle increases, not as dramatically as when I'm tilting it, but the same effect is there. It's subtle, but we can see the background starting to increase a little bit. One thing I want to point out here we go back to this one, there is no change in the background tail when I tilt. There's no signal out there that would introduce a change. Everything's conductive, everything trails off towards the 15. Here, if you look careful, when we start to go to very long working distance, the 25 and 30 millimeter, the green and the red, you can see there's a slight increase in the signal there. And we can see sort of a bump that we get out here in this range. That's not x-rays. That's actually electrons that's getting into the detector. This is also one of the reasons why we recommend staying close to the design distance of the, mic of the uh, detector. So in this case 15 on the size of 8.5. If you move too far away from these um, in front of the detector, we have basically a magnet, an electron trap, to filter out any backscatter electrons that would come in and hit the detector. As you go very far away from the optimized geometry, these electrons can start to come in. On certain systems, um, you may see this even at the optimum working distance. Some of the older FEI systems were designed to be electron trap less where you had to put it into a special EDS mode and if you didn't do that you would see backscatter electrons um, slipping through. So that's another piece of information you get from, um, from the background modeling by looking at this high energy tail whether you have backscatter electrons slipping through in your signal or you're looking at the, uh, at the true Pramstadl, um modeling coming through. So, we, in sessionally, we can figure out what is the sample tilt by looking at this background tail. Here I have a uh, spectrum I collected with the sample flat. So I have zero degrees tilt. You can see the blue line overlaid on there gives a, um, a quite nice fit. If I take the same spectrum and lie to the model and say this is tilted at 50 degrees, you can see the blue line suggests we should have more signal here in the low energy range than we actually have. So if you get a bad background fit, there's a good chance it's not necessarily a problem with or it's not a problem with the background model. Chances are it's a problem with the sample. The background model assumes the sample is flat or at least at the uh, tilt value we get from the microscope. If that is not the case, there will be a deviation from the background fit. And if that's the case, don't click the quant button. The quant routine requires the sample to be polished, flat, conductive, infinitely thick. If it is all those things, you should get a very nice background fit. And if it's not, the background fit will be off and your quant results will definitely be off as well. So the Barmstrom model, theoretical model, it works very well when you meet the ideal conditions, when the sample is flat, polished and all of this. If it is not, you will see significant deviations in the background model as mis misfits, um, and that basically means don't 
click the button. You have bad data, your sample doesn't meet the requirements of the quantification model. In the APEX software we have, we also have an alternative background routine, which is called a SNP filter. Statistical nonlinear iterative peak clipping. And that's not a marketing term we came up with. If you look at the reference down the bottom, the original paper actually uses that acronym. Um, what that one does is basically applying a math filter on top of the model, so we're not, or on top of the background. So we're not modeling a physics-based approach to the background, but just a math filter. So the difference, when we look at it, this is a molysulfite. There's not much to see here. Um, between the SNP and the bump song, we have to look at the details of it before you start to see the differences. So one thing um, I showed first, the bump Stalin model includes sample self-absorption, detector efficiency, and all that. And that is included right here. We can see we have these jumps in the background model. That's the sample self-absorption. So if you have moly sulfide, you will see the absorption jumps from the moly and the sulfur in there. The SNP model has no input. It's just a bath filter. So you don't have the absorption lines in there. Um, it is subtle. If you really look at the details, it does make a difference. But most of the time, um, there's, it's subtle to the extent it's a few counts. You won't get any significant deviation in the quant results, whether you use one or the other. The advantage of the SNP model is that there's no user input. It's a math filter, it performs the same way every single time, no matter what sample you put in there. It's always consistent, um, again, it's just a filter. So it gives you a good fit, no matter what sample you have. If you have a fracture surface, you have a tilted sample, if you have particulates, whatever it is you have in there, you will get a decent fit with the SNP model. The Baumstrahlung, on the other hand, has absorption lines in there, and if you get a bad fit, that means something is wrong. Something is not meeting what we think it should be. If you have a fracture surface, the software, the microscope might tell us this sample is flat, but a fracture surface will have all sorts of angles in there, which will lead to a deviation compared to the, uh, the ideal model. As I showed you, in principle, it has information about the tilt of the sample, there's electron artifacts that will show up in here, um, and sample self-absorption is included in there, and it allows us to use the piece of background model as well. So, the Baumstrahlung is generally my recommendation, and if you're doing quantification, there's a lot of useful information hidden in the Baumstrahlung model. But, if you're doing qualitative analysis, just figuring out what elements that are in there, if you're looking at a fracture surface or particulates or whatever it is, you can get a bad fit and you'll get something like what we have on the right hand side here where you have a um, misfit, you have higher background than you have signal. And if you're trying to figure out whether you have a peak here, uh, right now we're cutting off over half of the counts using the background model because we don't have a good fit. The SNP model would just model the background in this case and make it easier to identify peaks. So something like a fracture surface, the SNP model may be good, it'll give you a pretty picture at least, and make qualitative analysis easier. But if you see a large misfit between your sample and the Baumstrahlung model, again, usually that's a big red flag to so not click the quantification button. Here's an example of where it can go wrong. I have a shadow particle. On the left hand side I have a Baumstrahlung model. On the right hand side I have a SNP model. It's a very low count rate here. Um, we'll play around on the microscope with some of this stuff in just a second. But you can see here the model says we should have an increase in signal here. And we see very little background here. The reason for that is that we have absorption that's happening outside the sample. So all of these very low energy x-rays are being attenuated. They should be there, but they're not. You have a misfit with the background, which means don't click the quantification button. On the right hand side, again, it's very low count rate. I have like 10, 15 counts on the background. 
On the right hand side you have the uh, SNP model which does not have that misfit down the low energy range because again it's just a math filter, it just tries to make it look pretty. So for quantitative analysis, use the background, uh, the Baumstrahl background, it will show you directly when you have a misfit. But if you're just doing quantitative analysis, trying to figure out what's there, the SNP model can be quite useful. So this guy here is our Apex software. I'll just zoom out a little bit. And I have a bunch of particulates in here. I just crushed and ground up. Grab an image. Uh, let's try to make that image a little prettier. Something like... One second. Let's see what we get here. Close down the quant tap for now so we can see the image. So I have quite a bit of particulates lying around on this surface here. And if I just select the spot randomly, go in and collect. Oh, I have my element list locked. Let's just unlock that. Reset this at least. So this is a magnesium fluoride. It's a, um, it's a standard, so it has known composition of magnesium fluoride. I'll grab a new image. And we are interested in just the background, so I'll turn the deconvolution off. And just collect spectrum over here. Hit collect. And if we zoom in on the background here, we can see I'm going out to 20 kilovolts, which is my actuation voltage. So I don't have any charge of any significance here. Oops. And turn the deconvolution off. And we can see here, I have a sharp jump here on magnesium. I have a sharp jump here from the fluorine. If I remove magnesium, that curve turns smooth because we're taking the sample composition into account into the modeling. You can see there is a couple of smaller lines right here. Um, we take both detector and sample into account. So this part right here um, is silicon. This is a uh, silicon nitride window detector, so we have the silicon from the silicon nitride taken into account. There is a small layer of aluminum on the front of the window to filter out any cathode luminescence, any light. So that is also included in the modeling of the background here. And the nitrogen peak, and we have a few uh, lower level absorption lines from aluminum and silicon L in here as well. But as I add elements to the list here, those absorption lines are included in the background. Oops, that's not phosphorus, that's a sun. And a bit of chlorine out here. Oops. You can add anything in there, but we can see this peak is so low the absorption is limited and we don't really see see anything in there. So the absorption is taken into account but it only really plays a role for any major peaks. Again we have the carbon is so small there is in principle a jump right there but low concentration meaning low self-absorption it doesn't matter much. The model is based on a basic fit. So we can, it's basically a series expansion of our Kramer's law. So we can add more fit regions in there to modify and make the curve look pretty. But the essence of it is, if my, background, if my sample is meeting the requirements of the quantum model, oops, 
I should be able to get a good background fit with a single background region. Basically, I just give it an anchor point and it calculates the um, Bamstrahlung all the way down to the low energy range. And we can see here it's reasonable, but it's not perfect. And if we look at where I actually acquired that point from, this is a slightly tilted surface. So if we go over and take a closer look at this guy, zoom in, grab a new image here. So we can try to do a few things this side of the particle versus that side of the particle this side and something that's roughly flat mm -hmm. i set it up for just a 10 second acquisition lifetime so it takes a little bit of time to go through while we're playing around with this we can go back in and review the spectrum we already have. So this is with a Bramstrahlung model. I can go in and change that to a SNP model. So now we no longer have any absorption jumps in there. I just have a straight up math filter. which includes pile-up corrections and everything in there. Go back to the live collection. We should be pretty much done. We're at point number four now. There we go. So now we have all four points. We can go in and review them. So, this is one of the ones where I'm not quite sure where the detector is sitting relative to the sample. But we can see we do get changes in background versus spot one versus spot two. Let's pull up those two just to show those separately. And do a line display of both of them. So we have roughly the same level out in the high energy range, but as we go down in actuation voltage, we can see we get a bit of a misfit between them because of the sample tilt. Um, we can try to drop down the actuation voltage as well. So right now we're at 20. This is a pretty light element sample. So we can bring it down to say 10 kilovolts. Please wait. And there we go. Try to get an image back and focus a little bit. Spend too much time doing that. Grab a new image. <clears throat> so now I'm at 10 kilovolts instead of the 15. So we'll grab a few more points. Hit the collect button. see just a second mm -hmm. switch over to the review mode and take a closer look at these two So now we have our background tail going out to 10 kilovolts. Again, we have no charging. 
the cuts off of the actuation voltage, we're changing the um, incoming electron energy, but we still get the same Dwayne Hunt limit. Yeah. It's not so easy on this one to get bad results, unfortunately, because we're at a long working distance. Uh, let's see if we can find one that's a little worse conditions. Okay, let's try something like this. So the closer your intersection distance is to the microscope, um, the more of an effect you'll typically have from the sample not being optimized um, tilt-wise towards the, uh, the system. Um, this system has a relatively long working distance, or intersection distance of 15 millimeters, which is why it's not as sensitive to some of these things as maybe the size would be where I had some of the data before. But this is, this one is a good example of a very shadowed particle. So I chose this point on purpose. You can see it's a small particle, still magnesium fluoride, but it's hidden inside a cluster of larger particles. And we can see this is a very abnormal background we have here. I have signal in the high energy range but then it drops down and then it goes up again when we start to meet the characteristic radiation or characteristic peaks down in the low energy range. So this is one where if I were to use a Bumstrahlung model for this one, put one point in the high energy region, I should be able to calculate the Bumstrahlung all the way down and we see this is a horrible fit. This is not because the model is wrong. This is because you have a lot of sample self-absorption we generate x-rays down in this whoops, where did my cursor go? In this cavity right here, and most of them are absorbed as they try to escape out to the detector to the large particles around them. So this misfit here is not a modeling problem, it's a sample problem. And it tells you don't click the quant button. But again, if I'm trying to do let's just go into the review mode and load that one up. If I'm trying to do qualitative analysis, is there magnesium there, uh, get an idea of how much? The SNP model is much, much better. You see the SNP model is just a math filter. It gives you the peak you have out there. It gives you the drop, and it goes up down here. It gives you a pretty curve. Whether it's physically correct or not is another question, but it gives you a pretty curve. And you don't get the uh, negative count, so to speak, where the background goes up above the peak. So it's much easier to pull apart if you have close peaks or overlaps, whether it's um, magnesium fluoride or what else you have in there. Here we can go in and add the aluminum. Um, so here we can quite clearly see there's a small aluminum peak above background. We have a oxygen peak above background as well. But if I use the Bamstrahlung model on the same spectrum, and use a single region out in the high energy part. I don't really have an aluminum peak above background because my background is pretty much way above my characteristic peak. Again, this is not a model problem, it's a sample problem. But having that distinction is, is important to, uh, or understanding that distinction is important. If we go in and compare these two, there's not too much difference. Again, it's not too sensitive to, uh, to the tilt on this system. One is tilted towards the right-hand side, one is tilted up. I'm not 100% sure which direction the detector is sitting in here, but here we definitely see the absorption. Let's try to pop over to one of the other samples here. And I have a couple, but this looks like it's the one I was looking for. 
let's just try to get rid of a little bit of that wobble. Perfect, but better. And focus a little bit better. And a bit of stagnation as well. And then we should be getting close to a somewhat prettier picture. Grab a new image here. And a lot of these shows up very bright. I believe this may be my silicon dioxide. We'll find out in just a second. So let's do one of the larger particles. Oh. This was not my sample, this is a customer sample, but it still <laughs> shows the point of this. Um, right now I am using, oops, let's bring that one out again. We just use a single background region out here in the higher energy part. You can see I have a significant misfit. I'm at 10 kilovolts on the sample, but you can see my tail drops off here at eight. I have about two kilovolts of charge buildup on the top of this particle, which changes my ionization potential um, for the, the moly and the oxygen. So if I were to go into variable pressure now, collect the same spectrum, those relative to peak heights would change. Again, I can see I have a significant misfit in my background model here using oops, a fit anchor in the relatively high energy range. It's not a problem of the model. It tells you something is wrong with the sample relative to the requirements you need to do proper quantification. I can use, of course, with using more fit points, I can make this work, um, but give me any curve and enough points to fit it with, I can make it look pretty. That doesn't mean it's correct. So adding more fit points in there, we can get a reasonable background tail, but you can still see there's something wrong in the high energy part of it because it's, uh, it's charging. So you can make it pretty with the Bramstalling by adding more and more fit points in there, but if you don't get a good fit with just one single fit point, that's a good chance you won't get good point results out of it either. If we go, whoops, not that guy can load this up in the review mode that I have set up to use. Oh, I think I changed it back to, yeah, I changed it back to Armstrong. Let's go back to SNP again. So changing background available in Apex only or in Team it's not available? It's not available in uh, okay. Team for, for SEM. Um, we used the SNP background in the Apex software because the original iterations of it were intended for, for entry-level audiences where doing a full discussion of what Warmstrahlung is might be a little overkill. It was more QA, QC stuff. Um, it does perform quite well for the quant modeling when you, have, um, when you have ideal samples or samples that meet the model requirements. Um, but then as the software mature, we are adding the full Baumstrahlung, we'll add more and more quant routines in there. The SNP does perform well, and it does have its, its, it meets some requirements. If I'm looking just for qualitative analysis on tricky samples, particulates, I don't necessarily want to see the big misfit I see from a Baumstrahlung model, knowing that I can't do quant on it. Um, but it does make it easy and give prettier curves for when you're just doing uh, qualitative analysis. We can see here, now I switched it into the SNP model. The model now drops down nicely to where the background drops off. And we get a reasonable fit all the way down. You don't see any absorption lines. You don't see much of a change when I include peaks. 
or, or exclude them simply because it's a math filter. It doesn't take anything of the sample self-composition into account. So you get a pretty curve. If your sample meets the model requirements for quant, you still get reasonable results, but you're cutting out some of that additional information you would get in the Baumstrahlen model that a bad fit means don't click the quant button or at least don't trust the results if you do. If the background cuts off, that's an indication of the charge. And as it is right now, we just pull over the excavation voltage from the microscope. I'm at 10 kilovolts. The model will assume the landing voltage is 10 kilovolts. You can see it from the background tail whether it's 10 kilovolts or not. So if you know this one has 8 kilovolts, I can go in and update the file parameters and now everything will recalculate with an excavation voltage of, or landing voltage of 8 kilovolts. So you can change it that way. It is one of the things that we are probably going to add in as a hint to users um, that if we see the tail doesn't meet the excavation voltage, give a big red pop-up box, your sample is charging, are you okay with it? Um, same thing with the, the low energy background I showed you. In principle, we can calculate whether your sample is tilted or not beyond what we read from the microscope. It requires pretty good statistics. You can see these are relatively subtle changes we see here. But in principle, we can calculate what is the effective takeoff angle based on how much of a misfit we have between the high energy and the low energy range. And that's probably also one of the, uh, the feedbacks we'll add into the system at some point there is distinct advantages to, to including the background in the spectrum. Um, some people filter it out in the uh, pulse processing side of it, so you only see the characteristic peaks, but in our opinion, you, you're cutting out information by, by doing that. I should have a very charging sample in there. This is definitely charging. This should probably be my silicon dioxide. Go in and pull this up and grab a quick spectrum from it. So you can't quantify charging samples because of the background or because of the peak intensity is also affected? It's primarily because the peak intensity is affected. The X-ray yield from the given elements that we calculate based on the actuation voltage depends. If, if you change your actuation voltage, you change the relative, the relative peak heights. If you go lower in excavation voltage, as you go closer to the absorption line of a given element, the efficiency of excitation or ionization drops dramatically. So if you're trying to do silicon, the, uh, the silicon emission line is at 1.74, the absorption is about 1.9. So as soon as you go down to about 2, 2.2 kilovolts, you can't even see the silicon line anymore, even though it's a silicon dioxide. Um, as you move further and further away, you get more and more excitation. You also get more background signal, but you get higher excitation of the silicon peak. So in general, as you go to high excitation voltage, you push up the high energy peaks and push down the low energy peaks. You change the relative ratio between them, and the change can be very significant. So if we lose two kilovolts of excitation voltage or landing voltage due to charging, that affects that relative peak height, which will give bad quant results. So we can see here, this is my silicon dioxide. And I have 10 kilovolts of actuation voltage, but my landing voltage is probably somewhere around seven. I have about two kilovolts of charge buildup on this sample. And if we look at the numbers, let's just delete that carbon. 8118 atomic percent, that's nowhere near a silicon dioxide because the requirements that we need for the model is not met. We think it's 10 kilovolts coming down, but it's not. It's about seven. And that affects the entire math going on behind the scenes, so you get wrong results. But if you just fix landing energy in your formula, you can... If we start control. playing around with what the actual landing energy is, We guessed about seven. Looks like it's a little lower than seven, but now I'm getting 63, 63.36, which is much, much closer to a silicon dioxide. 
and that's just by changing by, well, just, it's by changing by three kilovolts, which is quite a significant charge builder. But if we get the wrong input parameters to our equation, yes, the results are going to be wrong. Same thing with the sample tilt. If, you, if we tell the uh, software the sample is flat and it's not, we are going to get deviations in there. And having the Baumstrahlung model helps you see what those deviations are. Right now we have it anchored here in one fit region, but again, if I use the single one high energy fit region, something out here, oops, ah. I have the, the other model turned on. Everything starts to short circuit right now. Um, but it tells us that something is, is wrong. We have a misfit. Don't click the quant button unless you try to figure out what is really going on. Yes, we can change the landing voltage, get a better result. Um, but at the end of the day, your sample is charging, and that's the main issue we are having right here. So if we have charging samples, you can see that in the, uh, in the tail. You can, you can read the Duane Hunt limit directly from the tail of the, uh, of the background. Compare that to the landing voltage that tells you if your samples are charging. Backscatter electrons, hopefully you shouldn't see them, but it depends on your detector. Um, we always have electron traps on our detectors, but some of the other vendors have their specialized low energy detectors. They say don't use them above X kilovolts of federation voltage. This is the primary reason that you start to get backscatter signals, uh, backscatter electrons into the signal. And you, again, you can see that by comparing, it should be a nice tail off. If you start to see a bump out in the high energy range, that's because you're getting backscatter electrons in. And we can also see that in, uh, when we move to bad geometry conditions, when we're very far away from the intersection distance, you can start to see backscatter electrons as well in the signal. You do get a lot of information with the full theoretical calculation, um, where you can see if there's an offset in low energy range, that's usually because your sample is not perfectly aligned, perfectly flat. And even if your stage is flat, that doesn't mean that your sample is flat. You can have an offset there, and that can be seen in the low energy range of the, uh, of the background fit. If you see a bad fit in the theoretical Baumstrahlung calculation with one single high energy um, bounding target, or fit region, that's pretty much an indication that you shouldn't click the quant button or at least not trust any of the results in a meaningful sense. You can still get a rough idea of what's in there, but more qualitative analysis than quantitative. The SNP filter gives you a nice clean curve. It's uh, always nicer to show clean curves and uh, good fits when you're handing data over to people. So that's a you can use it, but you don't have the same level of information in there. But it can be much better for when you're just doing qualitative analysis on non-ideal samples, stuff where you shouldn't do quant anyway. Um, having a nice fit and seeing the peaks above background can make it much easier to distinguish um, whether an element is there or not. But again, if you need the fit and SNP models to get a good fit, don't trust the quant results. You can get good quant results with the SNP model, but it all depends on the sample um, conditions, whether it meets the requirements for the quantification model.